D. Eve a cortical error. My name is James Nagel. Welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. Following the Solo Head Bay ambush and the dramatic rescue of Sean Hogan at Knock Long, the Premier County had become too hot for Tipperary's Big Four. They headed to Dublin to offer their services to General Headquarters, and while their arrival wasn't welcomed by the IRA Chief of Staff Richard Mulcahy, for Michael Collins it was perfect timing. The intelligence war had just kicked off, and the Tipperary men were deployed alongside the squad, taking part in a number of attacks against the Dublin Metropolitan Police. Towards the end of the year, they began to plan their most audacious mission yet. They would attempt to kill the King's representative in Ireland, the Lord Lieutenant John French. Dan Breen explains the reasoning behind this decision. Why should we not strike at the very heads of the British government in Ireland? Such action would arouse interest in Ireland's cause throughout the world. It would strike terror into the hearts of British statesmen, and it would help to render British rule impossible. Britain could survive the loss of a few peelers. It would be more difficult to do without a Lord Lieutenant. On the morning of the attack, Michael Collins woke Seamus Robinson and gave him his instructions. Mick gave Sean Tracy and me the they shall not pass, point to hold, the last corner French would pass before the castle was reached. We were told that the convoy was to be attacked all the way from Dunleary. If French escaped these ambushes, we too were to see it, he did not get past us alive. Robinson and Tracy waited at their point for hours until five o'clock in the evening when they heard a number of men talking loudly and laughing. Round the corner from Dame Street came Michael Collins, Sean O'Mortela, Sean McGarry, Thomas McCurtain, and others. It's all right, shouted Mick. He isn't coming. According to Robinson, Mick was able to give the impression to the volunteer officers from all over the country that he not only organised the attacks on spies that had begun in Dublin, but that he also led them, taking part in them. It's October of 1919, and this is the first of, according to Dan Breen, 12 failed attempts to kill the Lord Lieutenant. On the 11th of November, Armistice Day, French was expected to pass Grattan Bridge to attend a parade. Breen says that some of the men positioned there to bomb his car as it passed had pulled the pins from their grenades and were keeping the springs pressed with their fingers, ready to react at a moment's notice. For two hours they waited like this until they gave up. On another occasion, Breen and Pather Clancy spent a considerable amount of time at the door of a doctor French attended, on the off chance that he might just show up. Robinson called the first failed attack on French's life a phony attack, orchestrated by Collins, who he described as a bit of an artful dodger, so that he could present himself as a soldier. It was important for Collins to be seen as one of the fighting men, especially in front of high-ranking officers from his home county, such as Thomas McCurtain, and it was an image that he would cultivate during the Civil War. The reality, though, was that while he was an organisational genius, Collins had no military experience whatsoever. His belief in his martial prowess and the aura of invincibility that he had built around himself would prove fatal when presented with combat for the first time at Bailnablaw. Collins's posturing, the poor intelligence and repeated failures had really gotten on Robinson's nerves. When warned of another planned attack on the 19th of December, Breen says that Robinson informed me that he was having nothing to do with it and that he was not taking part in any more of these Dublin exploits. I told Tracy about this, and actually we did get him to come with us to Ashtown. A good thing too, because this time French showed. The evening beforehand, squad member Vincent Byrne had gotten hold of information that Lord French would be returning to Dublin by the morning train. He rushed to tell Mick Macdonald, who considered this the best bit of news I've heard for a long time. Byrne was told to come back at ten in the morning, and when he did, he found a group of men gathered for the operation. Most, such as Tom Kyo and Paddy Daly, he already knew, and Macdonald introduced him to Tipperary's Big Four. Earlier that morning, they had met Martin Savage, a veteran of the 1916 Rising, who insisted on joining the ambush. Sean Hogan attempted to dissuade him, but eventually gave him a weapon and agreed to meet him near the station. They left McDonald's in small groups to rendezvous at a local public house. On the outbreak of the First World War, Field Marshal John French was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the British Expeditionary Force, but resigned following a military defeat in late 1915. He was made Commander-in-Chief of the British Home Forces in December and personally selected General Sir John Maxwell to suppress the 1916 Rising. 
Against the advice of John Redmond, he refused to interfere with Maxwell's decision to execute rebel leaders. Fifteen were shot by firing squad before the government stepped in, unsettled by the growing public outcry. In May of 1918, French became Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, demanding near-dictatorial powers to enforce his vision of a quasi-military government. He was supportive of conscription being enforced on Ireland immediately, and one of his first acts was to order the arrest of the entire Sinn Féin leadership on trumped-up charges of planning another rebellion with German aid. This only hardened opposition to conscription, and his attempts to save face by getting 50,000 voluntary recruits failed spectacularly. In 1919, he allowed all Aaron to meet without interference, only because he believed the TDs would make fools of themselves and lose the support of the Irish people. When this backfired, he suppressed Thal Aaron, Sinn Féin and cultural movements like the Gaelic League. In early December, he had assembled a committee, including Alan Bell, who would soon fall foul of the squad, to advise on the situation in Ireland. Their solution? Infiltrate Sinn Féin and kill members of the party leadership. We are inclined to think that the shooting of a few would-be assassins would have an excellent effect. I'm sure you can see why people didn't like him. On the morning of the 19th of December 1919, as French's train approached Ashtown Station, those determined to kill him had gathered at Kelly's pub nearby, drinking minerals and discussing the price of cattle with locals so as not to arouse suspicion. At 11.40, a convoy of cars heading to the station alerted them that the train was arriving, and they rushed to take up their positions. It was known that French always travelled in the second car in such convoys, and so Dan Breen, Martin Savage and Tom Kyo were ordered to push a farm cart across the road to block the convoy, while the rest of the men had gotten into a field adjoining the pub and had taken up positions from where they would be able to shoot and drop grenades. There is disagreement around the exact plan for the cart. Breen, in his not-always-trustworthy biography, says the aim was to allow the first car to pass by as they knew French would be travelling in the second. MacDonald says that he ordered them to push the cart body-first onto the road and block all four cars. When they bought the cart out the wrong way, MacDonald started swearing and shouting at them to turn it around. They lost valuable time in doing so, and the first car sped by them. When the second car arrived, the one they believed contained the Lord Lieutenant, it was assailed by gunfire and grenade. A detective sergeant who was sitting beside the driver was injured by a grenade blast, and the car veered off the road, as the third one in the convoy arrived, carrying the bulk of French's military escort. They returned fire as they drove through, concentrating especially on the exposed men by the cart. Breen was shot through the left leg, and Martin Savage was killed either by fire from this escort or from the fourth car, an open-roof sunbeam which contained a driver and a single sergeant. MacDonald describes the outcome of the battle in his Bureau of Military History statement. We captured the driver of the second car, and to our amazement discovered there was nothing in it but luggage. Lord French had been in the first car, which had sped through the ambush before the firing started. Martin Savage's body was left outside Kelly's pub after the door was shut against them, and the men broke up to escape before the military arrived. The mission had been a disaster. Paddy Daly later said, The failure to get Lord French was mainly due to the road not being blocked. But had the road been blocked, I think none of us would have come back alive from Ashtown, because we were outnumbered by at least three to one, rifles against revolvers. All our bombs would have been gone, and we would not have had a chance. When the Prime Minister Lloyd George was informed of the ambush, he remarked dryly, they were bad shots. However, the attempt to kill such a high-profile figure as the King's representative in Ireland greatly unsettled the British establishment, and three days later, when he addressed the House of Commons, setting out his proposals for a Government of Ireland bill, Lloyd George referenced the Phoenix Park murders. In 1882, the newly appointed Chief Secretary and Undersecretary for Ireland had been stabbed to death with surgical equipment by the National Invincibles, an extremist cell within the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Almost 40 years later, the event still struck terror into the hearts of those sent to deal with the Irish question, and reminded them of the darkest days of the land war. December had been a difficult month for Michael Collins. 
As well as this failure, two British spies had closed in on him, and an attempt was made to halt the deteriorating situation in G Division by bringing in Detective Inspector Forbes Redmond to take over. He gave the men under him one month to capture Collins, or they would be forced to resign. In January of 1920, Michael Collins will respond in kind. The new year will also see the start of recruiting to the Black and Tans, as attacks escalate throughout the country. Follow the channel on Twitter to be kept up to date with new episodes and events in Westminster, where Lloyd George will present his plans to partition the island of Ireland. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of all.